You're recording. You're on. I didn't have the 17. They're not laughing at you. They're laughing. No, they're laughing at you. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. She was pregnant. You're going to say they're laughing with me. Yeah, no, I wasn't no, laughing. No. <laughs> you got I like one more. <laughs> All right, we'll get started here and hopefully we can sing them in. Uh, turn to 17, that's been our lead-in song here for a long time, but it's a good one. We all need to revive it. We praise thee, O oh God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now God above. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, find the glory, revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, find the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, find the glory, revive us again. that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, find the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, find the glory, revive us again. All right, I think we've got our fix. Four. Eighty-four. It's a good one. First John, chapter two, verse fourteen. Okay. All right. Here we go. Trials dark on every hand and we cannot understand All the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land But He'll guide us with His eye and we'll follow till we die We will understand it better by and by By and by when the morning comes All the saints of God are gathered home Tell the story How we overcome We will understand it better by and by We are often destitute Of the things that life demands Want and shelter and the food Thirsty hills and barren land But we're trusting in the Lord And according to His word we will understand it better by and by, by and by, when the morning comes. All the saints of God are gathered home, tell the story how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by, temptations Snares often take us unaware, and our hearts are made to bleed. For some taught us word or deed, and we wonder why the test. When we try to do our best, we will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathered home. Tell the story how we overcome. 
we will understand it better by and by. Okay, just a pass on the <coughs> Okay, if you will, uh, turn to number 450. That's our prayer song. And we always uh, see if there's any prayer requests, anything you want to share with us. Lady at the hotel front desk, husband was run over by a tractor. And uh, he's been in the hospital 14 days and will be began his extensive rehab today. And I told her we would certainly remember him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this time of year, a lot of tractors operate. We, we run into these things. Anyone else? Dad, remember Bill and Wanda. Okay. Bill and Wanda, they've, uh, they've been on our thoughts and prayers for a long time. You're tough. Gonna be all right. Remember Charlotte Allen. Okay. Remember Charletta? Is that uh, Allen? Uh, I don't know if they're usually on on Sunday night on their virtual. I, I don't know if they've been on any of this. By the way, Joni watched us. Um, I think last night they were coming back from Florida, from toward Nebraska, and uh, she picked us up. How about that? So you're getting out there, preacher. Good. You may get somebody may try to just gobble you up. Get you, get you. Right. I wish you she. Jimmy, uh, there was a, a gentleman I uh, was in court with that wasn't feeling very good, and I told him we'd keep him in prayer. And then there's a mom that's having some issues with addiction, and she's lost her children. And I told her we'd remember them as well. So keep those people in mind. God knows. Remember the ones that Tom has talked to? Uh, I lost a, a good friend that I grew up with, H.C. Prater. He was 85, and uh, we grew up together around West Liberty, and now he's gone. <laughs> that kind of gets scary. I'm two years behind him, you know. But uh, I'll be here as long as the Lord wants me to be here. It's that simple, because I'm trying. I really am to stay fit and uh, stay stay healthy. Anybody else? Jimmy, remember my sister Nancy Hopper? She goes in to, sur to surgery in the morning, so remember her. Okay, will you, Sister Nancy? Uh, did we send her a card? Yes. Okay, so if you're here tonight, and I always say this, blessed are you. You could just as easy be one of these people that's been mis that's been mentioned. It could happen. Just that simple. And so we ought to praise him tonight through our singing and through our prayers and through <coughs> Brother Dale's preaching that the Lord will bless those that need him tonight and that we all need. It's just a matter of degree. We need to keep Ronnie in our prayers. Absolutely. We want to keep uh, uh, Ronnie in our prayers. Uh, He's got some things in front of him, but we're all with you, big boy. And uh, I want to mention, Paul mentioned that uh, he went down today to test down at the uh, urologist. And so uh, keep him in your prayers. Thankful for the prayers of God's answer. Sharon's back with us here tonight. Yes, yes. I started to give her a call. Uh, thank you. And never got around to it. surgeon at UK Children's Center today for the tissue that uh, gets over her windpipe and uh, larynx and she doesn't have to have surgery right now and as, as she grows the, and gets more uh, strength in her neck they think that will help that so we're hoping she doesn't have to have surgery but it's scary that she's having breathing problems we had the identical situation with Matt and Meredith's little girl, our little great-granddaughter. And when she was real little, I mean, you could really tell that she was, she'd snore, you know, and all that stuff. Hardly ever does it now, and that's what they told her. It'll probably, she'll probably outgrow it. So that'll give you some good feelings, Sharon. It does. Anybody else? You guys will remember Madison Klein, the neighbor up the road here. She just had surgery yesterday 
and she will get results from that. She had a mass in her neck the size of an egg. So they remove that and she will get the results of what that is next week. Okay, Madison Klein. Randy's wife. That's Randy's daughter. Is that daughter? daughter? Okay. Wow. Uh, do we get a card to her? If you can get her address in. I'll tell you, those cards mean a lot, I think. Okay, Paul's work. Work hands? I have a co worker that his wife has had um, a couple mammograms come back bad, so they're having to go a little further and see what's going on with her. Okay, what's her name? Becky Dickey. Becky, okay. Now, uh, if you if you want a card sent from the church, uh, as you give this this uh, announcement here in church, uh, get with Sister Charlene. She does a magnificent job on doing that. Misty has you their address, and I'll send it. Do what? Just have them get me an address so I can send it. Okay. Misty has surgery on May the fifth. That's your daughter-in-law. Yeah, suspicious cells. Okay. Somebody just come on. We're glad to have you. Okay. This, uh, I was kind of envisioning. You got to really get into something. You, you got to take a part of it. Uh, and I like to vision walking alone or alone with God, not alone. He, uh, he said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. And so when we walk and thank and pray, he's right there beside of us. Walking alone at eve and viewing the skies afar, bidding the darkness come to welcome each silver star. I have a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. God in his power and might is showing his truth and love. Oh, for a home with God, a place in His court to rest. Sure, in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above. Sitting alone at eve and dreaming the hours away. Watch it tonight. The close of day, God in His mercy come with His word, He is drawing near, spreading His love and truth around me and everywhere. Oh, for a home with God, a place in His courts to rest, sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above. Closing my eyes at eve and thinking of heaven's grace. Longing to see my Lord, yes, meeting him face to face. Trusting him as my all, wheresoever my footsteps wrong. Leading with him to guide me onto the Spirit's home. Oh, for a home with God, a place in His course to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God Before we go over to prayer, I'm going to read from Matthew 26, <coughs> starting with verse 36. It says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go, pray and wander. And he took with him Peter and two sons of uh, Zebedee, thank you, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, 
saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thou wilt. And when I very first ever read that, I thought, this was a long time ago. Um, I thought, well, if he knows and it's going to be his will, then really what, I mean, why should I have to even ask? But the more I studied and the more I read, I may read it a little different than other people, but it gives me almost a calming, just reassuring that I do my part and ask. And I don't have to worry about what's going to happen if he's going to answer or not. It's his will. It's whatever he wills, it'll be done. But I should do my part and ask. As we ask Brother Joe to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, Lord, we thank you for another beautiful day. You blessed us with, Lord. Thank you for this time to be able to come back out to your house, Lord, to hear more of your uh, messages, Lord, that we can grow just a little bit stronger. We also want to petition us tonight, Lord, for those prayer requests that was made here, Lord, that you know what the needs of the people are, but as Brother Jackie said, we've got to ask and we need to ask so that we can realize that, that you're the one that's taking care of the needs that we have. <clears throat> we understand that and we know that you can do all things, but it needs to be within your will because you know what's best for us better than we know of our own selves, and we thank you for that. We want to pray for those, like I said, that's on our request here, those that are sick and afflicted, also want to pray for those that lost a loved ones, Lord. There have been several families here hit pretty hard with close ones, Lord, that in the neighborhood. And, and it seems like it's been a rough uh, winter and spring so far, Lord, for a lot of the people that live right in this area. And we want to pray that you continue to give the comfort to those people that they need. But most of all, Lord, we continue to pray for those that don't know who you are. Ones that has listened to your word and they understand, but they haven't accepted you. They haven't believed to the point that they'll give their heart to you, Lord. We want to continue to pray for those and that the messages that have been, been brought out of this pulpit, Lord, will hit those hearts and that will spring up and seeds and that will grow and eventually they'll give their life to you. We also want to pray for this service again tonight, Lord, for Brother Willis as he brings the, uh, uh, the message that will be brought in the way be pleasing to you. Thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ, who went the old rugged cross. So we can have an opportunity to, to be able to have salvation one of these days to come and live with you in heaven for to be an eternal bliss. For all the many things you've given us, Lord, that we take for granted, Lord, we want to thank, take this moment and thank you for those. Be with us, God, direct us, lead us in everything that we do go, and let us give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> And then Sue says, Jimmy, you got a song. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Hey, listen, laugh about it. Go on. Uh, number 205, and I think this has got a alto lead, I think. And it says, A friend like you, and from the book of Proverbs, number uh, chapter 18, verse 24. This is what he says here. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That's pretty tight. <clears throat> this life is filled with sorrow and troubles here below. We all far made to wonder just why it should be so. In every tribulation, this life must bring to view. Oh Lord, we need a friend like you. Oh Lord, we, we need, need a friend upon this weary road. We need some wonder guys share a heavy load. We need some wonder love tell us what to do. Oh Lord, we need a friend like you. Oh Lord, we know you travel 
the road to Jericho and help the lonely pilgrim. The Bible tells me so. When earthly friends forsake us and all the world seems blue, oh Lord, we need a friend like you. Oh Lord, we need a friend upon this weary road. We need some wonder guys. together again and sharing this time of study with one another. Hope when you're feeling alone. What a great passage that was read tonight because when we look when even Jesus had times when he felt alone. As I said when we talked about temptation, when we talked about Christ himself being tempted and tried, he's experienced and he's gone through the very things that we go through day in and day out. And the message is, he survived it. And the message of hope that we have, whether it's illness, or death, or trials and temptations, or even being alone, we're going to survive it. When we look to the Bible, we're going to talk about a couple of characters tonight in the Scriptures that I believe that we can learn from when it comes to being alone. And if I were to ask you who you think for instance, is the most loneliest woman in the Bible. I wonder who you'd come up with. Well, I'll tell you who I came up with, and it's over in the book of John. John chapter 8. As a matter of fact, this woman that we're going to talk about for a few moments tonight, we don't even have her name. But I want you to put yourself in her place as we look at this in verse 1 beginning. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him and sat down, and he taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what saith thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. What's interesting about this particular passage is that most folks like to quote that last verse that we read there. He who is without sin cast the first stone. But that's not where Jesus stopped in his teaching there in chapter 8. He stooped down again, verse 8, and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, 
went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where art those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go, and listen to this, and sin no more. It wasn't a fact that Jesus was condoning what this woman had done, what this woman's lifestyle had been. It wasn't that, as so many say today, well, who am I to judge? The fact is, Jesus made it very clear to this woman what she was doing was not correct. It was not right. But what these scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders were doing was even more not right and correct because their intentions, of course, were to accuse Jesus and to be able to do these things to him so that he might foul up in the things that he was doing and, and they might be able to accuse him. And when they couldn't obviously come up with legitimate reasons to crucify him, we know that uh, they lied and, and did what they had to do there. It's so encouraging when we look to the Bible in verses like 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares on him, for he careth for you. We like for folks to care about what we're going through. We like for folks to care when we're hurting, when we're alone, when we have lost loved ones, whatever it may be. As mentioned earlier on, the writing of cars, the phone call, all of these things mean a great deal to know that there are folks that love us, folks that care about us, and that are interested in us. I thought about also another character, David, over in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And, of course, we know what David went through when uh, he committed the sin with Bathsheba, sent Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, basically to the front line uh, where he would ultimately be killed. Uh, but the sin that he committed with Bathsheba was at the end of the grief, certainly, that David experienced. And when you go over here and you look at chapter 12 of first Sam or 2 Samuel, beginning with verse 18, it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. This was David's child that died here. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servant whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. This is probably one of the most crucial times that folks feel alone in the loss of loved ones. Both in Texas and in Tennessee, I had the opportunity as a, a chaplain, uh, a police chaplain, fire chaplain, and in the hospital. But especially with the police, I had the opportunity to deliver death notices. And one of those things that no one certainly in their right mind probably would volunteer for, uh, so I volunteered for it. And in doing so, you realize that in many ways, certainly, you see folks at their lowest, but you also have the opportunity to try to help folks, try to encourage them to the best of your ability. But what I try to do on any occasion in delivering these death notifications is to try to find neighbors, friends, or family members that would be able to join me uh, and, of course, the police department uh, at this particular residence where these notices were being delivered. Why? Because people need those that love them uh, around them at a time like that. They need those things. And it's not that words are going to fix it. I've often said the book of Job would be a whole lot shorter if those three friends had just kept their mouth shut. Because sometimes there's nothing that we can say. All we can do is be there. Job's friends started out the first week doing pretty well as they kept their mouths shut, but they were there in support of Job. The problems began with Job as far as these so-called friends when they decided to 
say, listen, you wouldn't be going through this if you hadn't done something wrong. If something so terrible in your life hadn't happened that you sinned against God, you wouldn't be going through these things because everybody knows good people don't suffer. So when you look to those things and you realize the, the, the torment that Job went through a lot of time, even from his own wife who says, where's your integrity now? Why don't you curse God and die, Job? He didn't even have support from his own wife. Lost his family, didn't have support from his wife. And then he lost the friendships, basically, that he had as well But when it comes to these things. We want to understand what we need to do to get to heaven. We want to do those things. We want to be faithful. I'm reminded of a teacher who asked uh, the children in her Sunday school class, if I sold my house and my car and gave all of that to the church, can I, could I go to heaven? And uh, the children answered no. Well, if I clean the church every day and, and I mowed the yard and, and done those things, could I go to heaven then? No, they all said. Then the teacher asked these five-year-olds, well, what do I got to do to get to heaven? And the one little five-year-old boy says, you got to die. <laughs> you know, that is the first step, isn't it? I mean, when it, to actually make that transformation from this life to the next life. But we know as we get a little bit older, there's something a little more involved with, with just dying. We, we do have to die to the world so that we don't experience, of course, that second death that is so prevalent that's mentioned in the Bible. But I think the one person that I want to focus on for the remainder of the time tonight is found over in 1 Kings chapter 19. Because when we talk about loneliness, this is probably the first man besides Jesus himself that comes to my mind. And that is the prophet Elijah. Of course, Jesus went through a time to where he felt lonely. Uh, and the passage that was read tonight, certainly, clearly, as he was in the garden and his own disciples couldn't stay awake long enough, and even praying to the Father, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There had to be a great deal of loneliness on his part. Everyone had forsaken him. Everyone seemingly had turned from him. And if that wasn't bad enough for Jesus, we know that ultimately, as he began to take that cross to the hill of Calvary, there was still that feeling of loneliness, that, and he just couldn't bear the cross and had to have help with that. And even when they raised him up on that cross, there was still that loneliness where he would cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But you know, in all of these cases, whether it's Elijah or Jesus, or the woman that's been caught in adultery. In every one of these cases, we don't see where Jesus comes along or God comes along and condemns these people for feeling the way they do. Jesus makes it very clear, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm right there with you. And so when we begin to look at these things and we begin to understand all of what we're looking at, you can... Uh, Look at 1 Kings 19 and the prior chapter. Uh, Elijah has called for Israel and the prophets of Baal to come to Mount Carmel to get Israel to stop limping the two options and the two opinions and fully devote themselves. And, and what you hope at this point when you get to 19 is that Israel and the prophet Elijah with, with all that's going on here that you, that you hope that all of these things that are about to happen when you look at the end of the story, Elijah and all of this, that they all began to live happily ever after. I mean, that's the story we want. We talk about fairy tales and we talk about stories and we all want those happy endings. And sometimes we get those happy endings in the scriptures and sometimes we don't exactly get the ending we were expected. After all, this is a man of God. What does he have to be down about? What does he have to feel alone about? And yet he does. And we do from time to time as well. That's right. So when you look at these things and you look at what he went through with Ahab and Jezebel, as we're going to look at for the remainder of the time tonight. When you look at what he went through with Ahab and Jezebel, 
it wasn't exactly a peaceful and uh, a wonderful relationship uh, that he had with them. As a matter of fact, as we begin verse 1, we see him on the run. Why? Did he doubt God's power? Did he doubt what God would be capable of doing? Was he having his own little pity party? You know, oftentimes we do that. We get to feeling sorry for ourselves and we have that little pity party and not saying there's anything necessarily wrong sometimes. We all have those blue days. The problem becomes when we just remain in those blue days. Mm -hmm. When we begin to wallow in that and think that somehow we're just an exception, that we're the only one that's going through the trial and the tribulation. We're the only one that's going through health issues. We're the only one going through loss of life, of loved ones. We're it. We're the only one. We've been singled out. God, why me? And again, when even we look at the book of Job, and we're going to do that more later this week when we talk about health issues on Friday. Even when we look at that, God does not come down on Job and say, shame on you, Job, for feeling the way you do or expressing the things that you express because Job never charges God with it. But he does question. He does say, well, I wish I was never born. So when you look at this here and you begin to read some of these verses here in chapter 19, beginning with verse 1, where it says, And uh, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and, and went for his life and came to Bathsheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servants there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was cake baked on the coals, and a cruise of water in his head. And he did eat and drink, and uh, laid his head down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time, and touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of the meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount. Of God. So to begin with, you might say he's having somewhat of a pity party for himself. You might even look at this and say he's into some forms of depression as he says, tends to be doing a lot of sleeping. But that also comes from the lack of energy, the lack of food, the lack of eating. But we also see a man of God that has basically said, I give up. I give up. And whether you've come to this point in your life at times or not, we've all had friends and family members that certainly have. Friends and family members that say, what's the point of me going to church? What's the point of me trying to do what God wants me to do? I can't live that perfect life. And the fact is, God doesn't expect you to live that perfect life. He knows you can't live that perfect life. That's why he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. Amen. We want to go to heaven, as I mentioned. But we've got to be willing to give to God. Another cute story that I came across was a Sunday school teacher asking those eager 10-year-olds, if they had a million dollars, would they give it to the missionaries? And I like this. They all screamed, yeah, we'd, we'd give it to the missionaries. Well, if you had $1,000, would you give them to the missionaries? Oh, yes, we'd give $1,000 to the missionaries. Finally, he said, well, if you had a dollar, would you give it to the missionaries? And everybody said, yeah, except little Johnny in the back. And the teacher said, Johnny, you wouldn't give a dollar? What? You'd give a million? You'd give, you'd give the thousand? And, but, you, but Johnny, the teacher said, why wouldn't you give the dollar? He says, well, the difference is I've got a dollar. <laughs> you know, and sometimes I think that's the way we approach things. You know, we're willing, you know, people say, boy, if I hit that lottery. You know, boy, I'd, I'd give this much or I'd give that much to the Lord. Or if I won the sweepstakes, and I think back in the day it was Ed McMahon that came to the door with supposedly where you're winning. Boy, I'd give this. But you know, if we don't give when we have a little, God says you wouldn't give if you had a lot. You wouldn't. 
And so I think it's interesting when you begin to look at this story, whether it is Elijah or, or whether it is any of these characters that we're looking at here, after the amazing display that God had given uh, on uh, Mount, Mount Carmel, King Ahab now is going home to tell Jezebel just what has transpired. And Jezebel said, well, let me tell you, what's happened to those individuals is going to happen to Elijah. By this time tomorrow, he's going to be dead as well. Well, that would send fear into anyone. Even a servant of God, it would send fear. And we've got a lot of things today that we hear from individuals. We hear from politicians. We hear from so-called world leaders that say, hey, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And it takes some backbone to stand up and to say, listen, you're not going to do these things because God's with us. Elijah was a strong individual, obviously, because we know in hindsight now we know how Elijah dealt with this and we also know ultimately how Elijah didn't taste death. But the fact of the matter is at this particular time in Elijah's life, it's a little bit different. And Jezebel makes sure Elijah's aware of it. The message is clear. You're going to be dead. In, in verse 2 of chapter 19, um, that would be enough. It was for Elijah, and it would be for us to sour our day. <laughs> for someone to say, listen, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be dead. Well, that's not what we want to hear. That's not what we, want, what we want to hear. And that's certainly not what Elijah wanted to hear. He had the thrill of victory. And now he has this on his plate. So he goes from that thrill of victory that God has displayed his power uh, and now this pain of defeat as Jezebel says that these are your last 24 hours, Elijah. These are your last 24 hours. And so it comes down with Elijah, with us, with Job or whomever. Are we going to believe God or are we going to believe man? When man says there is no hope, and God says, oh, yes, there is. Oh, yes, there is. I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. We're either going to believe God or we're going to believe man. And we see that problem over and over again, even in the religious world today, to where people say, well, I want to do it the way we want to do it. Well, yes, but John 4, 24 says God's a spirit, and they that worship him must. Worship Him in spirit and truth. Again, as we talked about last night, it's not optional. It wasn't optional for Elijah. It wasn't optional for Job. And it's not optional for us whether we choose to do it or not do it. And still think that somehow we can live the way we want to and do what we want to do and still go to heaven. But we see now that the Lord is going to come to Elijah. In verse 9, he continues on. Uh, and as you look at these things and you understand uh, just where this is going, the Lord was with Elijah. And folks, the Lord's with us too. I think sometimes we look at these things within the Scriptures and, and we tend to think, as I mentioned uh, in the last two lessons, we tend to think that all of these things, whether it's Satan or whatever it may be, all of these things are things in Bible times, but they're not real today. Well, Satan is real today, and God is certainly real today. And, and the more that we understand that, and the more we appreciate that, obviously the more we believe it, the more we're going to be able to utilize that in our life. Verse 9 of chapter 19, he continues on. Uh, and he came thither into a cave, lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Now don't think for one moment, that God didn't know what Elijah was doing there. It's much like you remember when Jesus died and the stone was rolled away from the tomb. It wasn't so Jesus could get out. It was so that the people could get in. Jesus didn't need that stone moved to get out of that tomb. And when you look at these things, whether it's here or even in the Garden of Eden, where God would ask a question, that question is not for the benefit of God. God knew where Adam was. God knew what Adam and Eve were up to. God knew where Elijah was. God knew what Elijah was up to. And God knows where we are, and he knows what we're up to. We might be fooling a lot of folks, but we're not fooling God. 
And so he asked that not only for Elijah's benefit, but for ours. Sometimes this is the best way of trying to get to the meat of the issue. That's just ask the question. Make folks think. And so he does. He asks the question there. And he says, you know, where? You know, what are you doing here? What doeth thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altar, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Almost sounds like wham, wham, cry, cry. But we all feel that way from time to time. We do the very best we think we can do, and we look around as we sang last night, the song farther along, we look around and we see everybody else seems to be doing so much better. They seem to profit so much better than we are. They seem to get along from the world standpoint so much better. That's the feeling that Elijah has. Now, I'm alone. There's nobody else. I've done this. I've served you. I've, I've been faithful to you. I've been obedient to you. And look what I'm going through. I've got someone now that says they're going to take my life by tomorrow. Verse 11, he said, go forth, stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by with great strong wind and rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering into the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altar, slain thy prophet with a sword, and I even I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshah, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, over, uh, of Abel, uh, Abeloth, uh, thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel. All knees have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Maybe sometimes we feel like we're in this spiritual quest alone today. Maybe you feel like from time to time, and those that are listening and those that are here, maybe you feel like, here I'm trying to serve God, or I've tried to serve God, but at every turn, I seem to get kicked. I seem to fall, I seem to falter, or whatever it may be. I feel like I'm the only one trying to do what's right. Maybe that's the case in your family. Maybe that's the case among your friends. I'm the only one, I feel like, that trying to do what's right. But God reminds us we're not alone. As I look to the Bible, I, I feel very strongly that the Bible is clear in telling us that there's still good people in the world today. Amen. There's still people that are trying to serve God. The reason I say that, when you look back in the days of Noah, when there was every thought and every intent of man was on evil continually, God said, Noah, you're all that's left. You're all that's left. It doesn't really even indicate his family found the grace. It was Noah that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The family was smart enough to follow along with Noah and do what Noah said to do. But the fact of the matter is, it's clear that it was important that Noah understood that he had to be obedient, and he did. And when we look at the story of Noah, we see that. We see the obedience. That we're not alone. There are still good folks. There are folks in the church that are striving just like you are to do the will of God to the best of their ability, even when they get kicked in the teeth, even when they get knocked down, even when things aren't going the way we think they ought to go. And that, that's sometimes the biggest issue. We either go to God in prayer and we look at God sometimes like a genie in a bottle. That we're supposed to rub that lamp and he pops out and he's supposed to bestow upon us whatever we wish for. And I thought that as a child. 
I thought I could go to God in prayer for a BB gun or a bicycle. You know, I thought that was, you know, my, my line to make sure I got those things. What's strange is there are a lot of adults that still think that somehow God is that genie or puppet, that somehow God's made in the image of man instead of man being made in the image of God. And, and that's where the problem comes in with religious confusion. That's where the problem comes in with loneliness or health issues that we say, well, there's no hope. I, I'm not even going to try. And there are a lot of folks that you and I know that have just given up even trying. And it's sad because God has made it very clear that I will be with you. So when Elijah arrives at the mountain, we see that he spends the night in a cave. The word of the Lord asks him, what are you doing here? He gives somewhat of an answer in verse 10 there. But in verse 11, God is going to give Elijah some direction. Go back the way you came, and you're going to do some anointing, and you're going to do this, and finally anoint Elisha to be the prophet in your place. I think it was coming time, obviously, where Elijah had just been wore out. He, he was just give out. He had done so many great things, and God recognizes, you know, Elijah, you're just tired. And sometimes when we get tired, we get short in our temper. We, get, we say things or do things that we wouldn't normally do because we just wore out. We just give out. Elijah's coming to that point here to where he's just ready. He's just ready. So when we look at messages like this, sometimes people say, well, how do I apply this today? You know, Romans 15, 4 says those things were written before time were written for our learning. And that's what we have when we look at certain things within the Scriptures because whether it's the Old Testament, whether it's under the patriarch, the Mosaic, or the Christian dispensation, it's a common thread when you look at God or you look at the way He deals with certain issues and certain things, whether it's with David or Joseph or Job or, or Elijah. And so I think the message clear, clearly is how does God help us? And I think when we are feeling alone, I think we can go to these individuals and find that hope. We can find that hope. As I said, first off, I think what I have always gotten from this, as I've already mentioned, is God doesn't ridicule, rebuke, or even dismiss and say, Oh, Elijah, go on. Get over yourself. He doesn't do any of that. He cares about how you feel. He cares about what you're going through. And he doesn't laugh at all. And he doesn't scoff at you. He doesn't scold you for it. He wants to help you. He wants to help you. And when you think about that, I think it's important when we see what we're feeling and what we're going through and things aren't going right in our life. It's common to feel like no one gets me. No one understands this. And it's also common sometimes to go to folks and say, listen, I know what you're going through when we don't have a clue. Maybe we've been through something similar. Maybe we've had similar losses. We've gone through similar illnesses that, that help when folks hear about that. Sometimes people mean well, but it doesn't go as well sometimes when we're in the hospital and we get certain visits. I've been in the hospital as a chaplain there and been in the room when Uncle, somebody would come in for somebody that's sick there in the hospital and said, well, you know, old so-and-so died of that a few months ago. Well, that's not helpful, folks. You know, that's not what this person needs to hear at this time that, you know, hey, they went and you're probably going to die of it too. Well, we're all going to die of something. We're all terminal, folks. That's what we need to understand, and we're going to talk about that more as we go on the rest of the week. It's hard to believe that we're halfway through. Uh, our meeting already. But we're going to talk about that some more as we go. But what Elijah does next is so important because it's the thing that we must learn to do. Elijah prays to the Lord. Now, when we get in the midst of these struggles, being tempted, being tried, feeling alone, being sick, whatever it may be, is the first thing that comes to your mind to get down on your knees and pray to the Lord? Brother Gus Nichols, there was a story in his book that many years, obviously, has been ago. His wife 
became ill and was in the hospital. And he went up to the hospital and began pacing the floors of the hospital. A couple of the deacons went up there one night as he was pacing the floor and they said, Brother Nichols, they said, why aren't you doing what you've always taught us to do? What you have been drumming into our head year after year after year. Instead of pacing this floor, why aren't you praying? Brother Gus Nichols said he was so ashamed he went home and he laid face down in his garden and began to pray to God. His wife didn't pass away at that particular time. She survived that hospital stay. But I think sometimes it, it is those outside forces that remind us, listen, you know, you better practice what you're preaching. You better practice what you're teaching. If you're going to tell folks to do this and encourage them to do this, you better make sure you're doing it in your life because folks are watching you. Folks are watching you. And so Elijah prays. Once he leaves from Jezebel's rule, he stops in the wilderness and prays. He prays to the Lord. Sometimes we forget that we need to talk to God when we're feeling alone. And we ask the question sometimes, and you brought that up in the, in the Scriptures, why? Why should I tell the Lord what He already knows? You know, even as earthly parents and grandparents, we love to hear from our children. We love to hear from our grandchildren. Of course, I already, it, it always worried me from time to time how Mama knew many times before she ever even asked me, you know, what are you doing? She already knew the answer to it. I don't know how she knew the answer, but she knew the answer. She knew what I was doing, and she knew most of the time it wasn't something maybe that I ought to have been doing. But she already knew about it, but she wanted to see if I would come clean. God wants to hear from us. He wants to hear how our life's going. He said, well, he already knows. Yeah, but he still wants to hear it. He still wants to hear from us. He still wants to see that we are seeking first, Matthew 6, 33, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So many today are seeking first other things. They've got primary things in the secondary position and secondary things in the primary position and that just mixes and messes everything up. And it just doesn't work. So God brought Elijah to the mount to the presence of the Lord, came to Elijah in a gentle whisper. And I think the key there is that Elijah needed to get away to a quiet place where he could hear the Lord. Sometimes we've got to find that place of solitude. We've got to find that place where we are alone. Not lonely, but alone. So that we can hear the voice of God in the scriptures. That we read this and that we can take it in and that we can digest it. I've never been a big fan of folks reading through the Bible in one year. That's fine if you want to do that, but I'm more interested in you reading through the Bible to where you understand it. And if you spend an entire year just going through one book, then so be it. So that you digest it. So that you're able to understand what you have read in that way. He needed to get away, and he did, to a quiet place, to understand that the Lord was there, the Lord cared, and he needed to understand that. God didn't send his son so that we would just simply give up. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13 and verse 5. We either believe that or we don't. God let Elijah know that he wasn't alone, and he did so by telling him, listen, Elijah, there are 7,000 others that haven't bowed to Baal. 7,000. Elijah said, I'm, I'm it. God said, no, you're not. There's 7,000 others. That had to be an encouragement to him. You're not the only one who's left trying to do what's right. And that's the message to everyone tonight. You're not the only one left trying to do what's right. It's wonderful to be able to come like this and see those hundreds of miles away, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're family, and there are others that are trying to do what's right and follow the teachings of the Scriptures to the best of their ability. Even during difficult circumstances, you're not alone. You're not alone. There will always be a remnant of God's people. In fact, when there is no longer, as I said, a remnant of God's people, there will be no reason for this whole world to keep turning. That one day when God's going to turn to Christ and tell him, I've had enough, go get your bride. 
it's done. That day is coming. Now, what side we're going to fall on that day is up to us today. That's why we've emphasized over and over again, the Bible does today, now. There's no waiting. The Ethiopian eunuch, you remember, he said, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip didn't say, listen, why don't you just wait till you get back home? Why don't you just wait till next week, next month, next year? Whether it's 12 noon or 12 midnight, the immediacy was necessary for the unit, and it is for us as well. Now is the time. Philip said, if thou believest, thou mayest. And they both went down into that water and took care of what needed to be taken care of because they knew that that was the only way to get remission of sins then, and it's the only way to get remission of sins today. That's right. So if you're a child of God and you've wandered away, there's only one thing you need to do right now, and that's come home. Because you have brothers and sisters that care about you. God's not rejected you. He's not rejected His people. And when we look at the Scriptures and we see this with Elijah, we can see that encouragement for us today as well. Jesus knows what you're going through. We sing the song oftentimes. He knows what it's like to be in mental anguish. He knows what it's like to be in turmoil and waiting for death of the body. He knows. What did Jesus do when he was faced with all that? The same thing Elijah did, the same thing you and I better do. He prayed. And if Jesus needed to pray, boy, do we need to pray. He prayed. So make sure that you're turning to the Lord. Let Him strengthen you. Let Him keep you. And if we can help you in any way tonight to get your life where it needs to be, won't you come and let us know while we stand and sing. <coughs> Living below in this so sinful world Hardly a comfort can afford Striving along temptation sore where could I go but to the Lord where could I go oh where could I go seeking a refuge for my soul needing a friend to save me in the end where could I go but to the Lord He was doing good as long as he was preaching. You left him. Hey, there you go. Anybody have a word before we dismiss tonight? It's been a good, it's going to be been a good meeting. Uh, continue. I've talked to people this week and they said, so-and-so at the church up there asked me to come. I said, I'm going to come. And so, uh, either high floor or high empty, we're high over, he says. But, uh, 
keep in prayer that the, that the Lord will, His will will be done, and uh, keep in prayer that uh, people will come before it's everlasting too late. Anybody have a word? No? Tommy, would you close us out with a word of prayer? Lord, thank you for another day. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, we have the freedom to come out here and listen to the word. We pray as you go down through the rest of the week, Lord, that your will will be done here. We pray now, Lord, if it be one that's still lost out in sin, that something be said or something be done that will open up their eyes for it's everlasting too late. We also, Lord, want to pray for the one that's been mentioned here tonight that's sick. And we ask, Lord, if it be thy will, you'd make them well again. If not, you'd ease their suffering for a little while. Help the ones, Lord, that's lost loved one, comfort them in this time of sorrow. We know, Lord, it's pointed on the man that once he's born, that death will follow. We also, Lord, want to pray for the leaders of our county, the leaders of our nation, and the leaders of the world, Lord. We pray that they would look to thee for strength and guidance in these troubled times. And something could be said or done that they would open up their eyes and, and see, Lord, and, and make the right decisions as they go down through life. Be with our boys and girls at the harm way that, that's fighting for our freedom tonight, Lord. Trying to protect us, whether it be locally or whether it be nationwide, Lord. We ask that you be with them and bring them back to their families safely. Now we ask that you go with us wherever a lot may be cast. Asking all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Did you get it with Jack? Hey, yeah. No, that was real good, though. It went right into it. It flowed right into it. Working? Yeah, we're going to have to get off the sand with this. I'm going to have to finish the sand. You know, I'm going to have to spend $6,000. Be careful on the way home. Thanks for being with us. I don't want to see it's good. Good job. Yes. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> that looks, that looks wow. it's a tall set. This is all That's it. the first time I've seen it. It's a tall set. There you go. And then when it, the second song was over and they sat there, I was like, boys, I can get enough money. Y'all stay here. Y'all stay here. I'm out of 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 here. I'm out of